Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby! I'm Liv, your host and general crazy person when it comes to Greek mythology and my basic personality. Welcome back to the podcast. I want to take a quick moment to thank all of my new Patreon patrons. There's been quite a few of you lately, so just a huge thank you from me. I can't tell you how much it helps me keep this going. If you're interested in becoming a patron, or maybe you just want to help out in a small one-time way, head over to my website, mythsbaby.com, and click on want to help. There are a few options there for how you can help me make this podcast. For any new listeners, this is a one-woman operation. I do it all, and it takes a long time, so any help is always very much appreciated. Of course, not everyone can, and that's why it's wonderful that podcasts are free, so enjoy no matter what. Well, it's time for some more Odysseus. But things have really changed since we last saw my main man, or at least they're about to. After a few more disastrous and deadly hiccups, Odysseus has finally reached the shores of Ithaca. Sure, he's lost every single man he left Troy with, and it's been another ten years on top of the original ten years he was away at Troy, but he's back, welcomed by Athena disguised as a shepherd on the beaches of Ithaca, still a short ways away from the city itself, where God knows what's been going on. Because, think back to the very early Odyssey episode, when we talked about Odysseus's son Telemachus, his wife Penelope, and all they'd been dealing with. Those suitors. That's how the story began, before Odysseus told the story of his travels to the Phaeacians. But now, Telemachus's journey matches up chronologically to this moment, when Odysseus has returned home after all these years. This is episode 55. Ithaca, is that you? The Odyssey, part 8. Sing muses of wise Odysseus and how fucking long it took him to reach his home of Ithaca. Odysseus meets the shepherd, really Athena in disguise, on the beaches of Ithaca. This shepherd tells Odysseus, it is Ithaca. It's changed so much in these 20 years, Odysseus can't seem to see it for himself. But it really is. It is Ithaca. Home. Sure, Odysseus knows it's Ithaca now, but what has Ithaca become? How many times can I say Ithaca? He has no idea. Is he returning home to open arms? Has everyone waited for him? Or have his wife and son been overthrown by who only knows? Is an ambush waiting instead? There's just no way to know. So Odysseus plays it safe. He tells the shepherd that, yeah, he's heard of Ithaca, but he's come from far away on Crete. He's in exile, having killed Orsilochus, the sprinting son of Indomeneus. He tells them he'd chosen not to go with Indomeneus to Troy, but had led his own men, keeping true to one part of his story. He explains to this shepherd that he killed Orsilochus in the night, No one saw him do it, and he sailed away in secret to the Phoenicians. There, he explains, they helped him, but they were blown off course before finally ending up on this beach here with what's left of his treasure from Troy. If you can believe it, the lie he tells to explain who he is is actually far, far longer than what I've just told, and even more confusing, and I could barely make it sane. What's that saying about adding too many details when you're lying? Anyway, Odysseus does that. But he's talking to Athena, so it doesn't really matter anyway. She knows exactly who he is. That's why she's there. But he doesn't know who she is, so he's lying through his teeth. And with a smile, Athena transforms herself into a woman, and she proceeds to flatter the fuck out of Odysseus. Oh, you clever, clever man. To outsmart your lies, a person or god must be an expert in it. You're just such a good liar, such a storyteller. She goes on, but I won't bore you with her excessive flattery. She's a fan of Odysseus. That much is very, very clear. But you haven't recognized me, she points out with a smirk. I'm Athena, daughter of Zeus, and I am always with you to take care. In all the troubles you've been through, I've been there. I made sure the Phaeacians welcomed you, and I'm here now to help you come up with a plan to hide your treasure. I'll warn you of what's going on in Ithaca, what you'll face when you arrive. It's not good. So, she tells him... You mustn't tell anyone who you are or that you've finally arrived home. You have to just grin and bear their treatment just for a while. Odysseus 
worn out and not entirely thrilled to hear this detail, tells Athena that even the smartest man might not be able to recognize her. She's just so good at disguises. Seriously, the flattery these two throw at each other is a hint nauseating. But he pulls a switcheroo because in the next second he's calling her out on this so-called help she's been providing him. I don't know if you helped me in Troy, he says, but I sure didn't have your help when we sailed off from Troy, when we were hit with storms and monsters and so, so many other tragedies, all while trying to reach home. Odysseus is so jaded by what he's been through and by how little help he had from Athena that he doesn't even believe he's actually reached home. It has to be some trick. But no, Athena tells him about Penelope, how she's waited for him all this time, sitting each night in misery, waiting for her husband who's been gone 20 years. My God, how did she not just give up and find a new hottie? But now he's really home, Athena reassures Odysseus, and she begins pointing out landmarks he'll recognize. Look, that's the Bay of Forcus, she says, named for the ancient sea god. And there's the olive tree, you remember it. And that's the cave sacred to the Nereids, where you sacrifice so many cattle. With a wave of her hand, Athena pushes away the mist that she laid over the area. And Odysseus suddenly can tell exactly where he is. He's finally, finally, finally home. Odysseus is so utterly thrilled to be home. He thanks all the gods and nymphs he can think of. He kisses the ground. He promises to sacrifice anything they want. He's just, oh God, he's so psyched to be home. And who can blame him? 20 years! 10 of them traveling. Man alive, that would suck. Athena lets him have his thrill, but before long, she has to force him to stay on track. They need to hide the treasure so no one knows he's finally home, and they need to come up with a means of of ridding Ithaca of these pesky, pesky suitors. So they do. They hide all the treasure in a cave, place a stone in front of the doorway, and then they sit down to come up with a plan. First, Athena tells Odysseus what he's up against. There are suitors. So, so many suitors. They've been there this whole time, always trying to convince Penelope to give up on you and pick one of them. They've been eating your food and drinking your wine and terrorizing your family, all while Penelope finds excuse after excuse not to pick one of them, always waiting for your return. They need to get rid of the suitors by any means necessary, which means killing them, obviously. Their blood and brains will splatter across the floors of your home, Athena tells Odysseus. That she's sure of. But for now, you need a disguise. Athena transforms him into an old man, ragged and ugly. She tells him to go find a swine herd who lives nearby. He's loyal to you and to Penelope. He'll tell you everything. I, Athena tells Odysseus, must go to Sparta to find Telemachus. He's gone there to ask about you. The suitors are trying to kill him. They'll be laying in wait for his return. But I'll be there to stop them, to bring your son home. And with that, she's gone circling back to the early episode where Telemachus travels home to Ithaca with the help of Athena while the suitors lay in wait. So I say again, the narrative devices used in this book are incredible for something from thousands of years ago. I mean, full circle, right here, just swinging right back. Bringing us back to a moment from the beginning, flawlessly. Homer, you possibly fictional genius, you. Odysseus finds the swineherd, a man whose entire job is to provide pigs to the palace, something he's forced to do far more regularly with the suitors eating the place clean. They're running low on pigs, and the suitors are awful men who take what they want without any kind of deference. But this swineherd is a slave, owned by the palace, so he's forced to just go along with it, even though he knows how awful the suitors are, and not only to him. Odysseus approaches the gates to the man's land, and his guard dogs fly at Odysseus, still very much in disguise. The man shoos the dogs away, telling Odysseus he's going to get himself killed. The gods would surely punish the man then, and he's got it bad enough, he says, raising the pigs without the guidance of his master, feeding the men who wish to take over the palace completely. He tells Odysseus what it's like in there, all the awful men treating the palace like it's theirs to trash, 
always trying to force Penelope to pick one of them to give up on her husband, his master. Come, the man tells Odysseus, I'll give you some food and wine and you can tell me where you've come from, what troubles you've been through. Odysseus is so thankful for the hospitality. He's given somewhere comfortable to lie down, good food to eat, such a difference from what has faced the past months ever since he left Circe's island. And so, with this hospitality, the swineherd is finally also given a name, Eumaeus. Eumaeus tells Odysseus, who again is still very much in disguise, that he's happy to provide the hospitality. The gods look kindly on those who do. He doesn't have much, he says, but he'll share what he has. And he says, he knows he'd have more if his master wasn't being kept far away by the gods. His master would take care of him, give him what loyal slaves get a home with land, a woman to marry, payment for his many years of labor. But his master isn't there. He must be dead now, after all this time. Eumaeus tells his guest that his real master went away to Troy, went after Helen, damn her and her family. His master went away to Troy to win victory for Agamemnon, and look what that's brought him. They eat, And Eumaeus continues telling Odysseus about the suitors and all the trouble they're causing. He goes on and on, including listing everything his master had before the suitors arrived to clean them out of food and drink and anything else they could get their hands on. Odysseus sits in silence, listening intently to all Eumaeus has to tell him about the suitors, all the while planning what he'll do to them and how. Finally, when Eumaeus is finished and Odysseus has eaten and drank all he needs, he speaks. Who is this master you speak of? He asks Eumaeus, very clearly just wanting to hear even more flattery of himself. You say he went away to Troy for Agamemnon's honor. Maybe I know him. Such deception, Odysseus. If I know him, maybe I can bring news about him to the palace, Odysseus continues, hoping to find a means of meeting with Penelope and Telemachus. Eumaeus thinks on it then tells Odysseus that his mistress and her son don't trust travelers bringing news. They believe it's all lies. Too many have come through with so-called news of my master. Nothing has been true. Penelope welcomed them for a long time, but not any more. Doesn't matter anyway, he says sadly. I'm sure my master is dead. Long dead. Only bones now, lying on a beach somewhere. Eumaeus continues on, telling Odysseus how much he loved his master, how wonderful Odysseus was, calling him by name for the first time. At this, Odysseus, again in disguise, has trouble keeping up with the facade, but he pushes on, trying to reassure Eumaeus that all may not yet be lost. Maybe his master will return home still. He swears to Eumaeus that Odysseus is on his way now. He swears to Eumaeus that Odysseus will arrive, and soon, and that he'll come home and punish all the men who've disrespected his home and his wife all this time. Oh, the foreshadowing! Odysseus, very much in disguise as not Odysseus, has just assured Eumaeus that Odysseus, king of Ithaca, will indeed return home and punish all the suitors who have terrorized his palace all this time. But poor Eumaeus isn't convinced. No, what does this stranger know about the business on Ithaca and his master, Odysseus? Eumaeus humors him, this stranger. Yeah, sure. I'm sure he'll come back. He's not convinced. He tells Odysseus about Telemachus, how he's grown into a man, but a man ruined by the actions of these suitors. He tells Odysseus that Telemachus has gone to seek news of his father and Pelos, but that the suitors are lying in wait for his return. Odysseus isn't worried. He knows Athena will do what she needs to do. And finally, the conversation turns away from the whereabouts of the king of Ithaca, and back to this strange man who's appeared on their shores. Eumaeus asks Odysseus, So, what's your story? Where are you from? How'd you get here? Etc, etc. And boy, does Odysseus tell him. Right on the spot, Odysseus comes up with the most intricate and detailed lie you can possibly imagine, like pages and pages of lie. He says he's from Crete, that he's the son of a wealthy man, but not by that man's main wife. No, he says his mother was this man's slave his so-called concubine. 
though his father treated him like a true son. Why this unnecessarily dark and detailed childhood? No idea. And it only gets worse. The story is just bananas, honestly. There's a lot of tragedy and fake wives, fake battles, fake ships, everything. He peppers in some true, the war in Troy. And some important fakeries based in reality. That he's seen Odysseus, who's working on getting home. It's seemingly endless. I won't go into detail, but he paints himself as quite the martyr. And so when Odysseus is finally finished telling his story of tragedy and hardship, Eumaeus really feels for this strange man sitting in front of him. He feels for this man whose story is so tragic. But Eumaeus refuses to believe that the man's actually seen Odysseus. This and this alone, he calls out as a lie. Why would you lie about this? He asks angrily. I know the fate of Odysseus. The gods hate him. They'll never let him return home to Ithaca. But Eumaeus, though bitter at this man's lies, doesn't hold it against him. He's abiding by Xenia, taking care of this man he doesn't know is, indeed, his master Odysseus. That evening, they sacrifice and eat a pig with the other herdsmen that work with Eumaeus. They sit and talk, telling stories, though in the case of Odysseus, just more lies. Meanwhile, Athena visits Sparta, where she finds Telemachus. He should be sleeping, the others around him are, but he can't. He's thinking too hard of his father, Odysseus, and where he might be, if he might finally return home. Athena finds him there, and tells him he has to return home now. He can't delay any further. The suitors are eating and drinking Ithaca of all it has. She tells him that Penelope's father is going to try to have her finally marry a suitor, Eurymachus, because he's promised the best gifts in exchange for finally giving in. And Athena warns him, beware. A group of suitors are lurking offshore, waiting for you to pass them. They plan to kill you on your way home, so you'll never reach Ithaca to stop them from pursuing Penelope. But, she adds, many of the men wasting all of Ithaca's wealth and supplies will likely be dead soon. Go now, she says, as quickly as you can, and when you arrive back in Ithaca, don't go to the palace. Go first to Eumaeus, the swineherd. With that, Athena is gone, and Telemachus is up and kicking Pisistratus, Nestor's son, who's been traveling with him and who will travel with him to Pelos. He kicks him to wake him up so they can be on their way. And when they're up, Menelaus asks Telemachus to wait while he prepares gifts and a feast, but Telemachus doesn't want to. He tells Menelaus they must go as quickly as possible. But a feast is a feast, so they still have it, and it's just a little bit more rushed. The Spartans put on a feast as quickly as they can, and they gather gifts as quickly as they can. Menelaus and Megapenthes both give Telemachus gifts, a silver bowl, a goblet. Then Helen, she gives Telemachus a beautiful robe that she made herself, telling him to keep it until he gets married, and to give it to the woman he plans to marry. Not sure if Helen is the best gifter for something like this, but she's hot, so they still love her even after the whole ten-year war thing. Finally... They've been given gifts, they've feasted, Telemachus and Pisistratus are finally ready to be off. They're still in a rush, even if it's a bit more of a chill rush. And when they're about to leave Sparta, finally en route to Ithaca via Pylos, an eagle flies overhead. In its talons is a white goose picked from a nearby yard. They're excited. Eagles flying with things in their talons are usually a good sign. The eagle, remember, is a symbol of Zeus. Pisistratus asks Menelaus if he believes it's a good omen meant for them on their journey. But before Menelaus can answer, his wife does. Helen says she will make a prophecy, that just as this eagle flew down to take the goose, so will Odysseus return to Ithaca after all this time to lay ruin to the suitors who have done so much damage to his home and his family. <laughs> Finally, Telemachus and Pisistratus leave Sparta, just as they arrived, by land. They need to return to Pylos, where Telemachus' ship was left. But when they near it, Telemachus stops Pisistratus. Look, he says, though not in this way, you have to go home by yourself. 
I know that if I arrive in Pelos, Nestor will want to host me for me to at least stay a few days, and I can't. I have to get home. Take me to my ship. You continue on without me. Pisistratus agrees. He knows Telemachus is right, so even though it's super rude, and the ancient Greeks didn't love being rude, especially to people like Nestor, he does it. Telemachus goes right to his ship, and they prepare to leave, while Pisistratus heads home to Pelos by himself. But before Telemachus and his men can set sail, a stranger arrives. Because my god, do we need more characters and storylines, according to Homer, always. This man asks for help, says that he's had to flee his home because he's killed someone. You know how this goes. He killed a guy and he's to be purified. He tells Telemachus that powerful men in Argos want to kill him, that he killed someone from his own tribe and he needs to get away. Without a second thought on whether or not this is a good idea, Telemachus is all, yeah, that's totally cool. Come on board, stranger who just murdered someone. And with that, off they sail. Back with Odysseus and Eumaeus, Odysseus is still being deceptive and tricky. Now he's trying to see whether Eumaeus will let him stay there on his little farm. But instead of just asking like a polite, regular person, Odysseus must determine through trickery he's got issues. And finally, it probably doesn't help that he's been trying to get home for a decade and everything has gotten fucked up every time, but still, dude needs some help. Anyway, he tells Eumaeus that he plans to go into the city to beg there, to see Penelope and tell her what he knows of Odysseus and to possibly be a servant to the suitors. But Eumaeus, passing this test, isn't having it. No, you can't do that, he says. You have to stay here. No one minds having you around. And anyway, when Telemachus returns, he can give you some clothes and take you where you need to go. Again, Odysseus could have just asked. Changing topics, Odysseus asks Eumaeus after his parents. Of course, he must do it sneakily. Tell me about Odysseus's parents, this stranger asks Eumaeus. Okay, so maybe not super sneakily in this case. Eumaeus explains that Odysseus's mother has died, a tragic death. She mourned her son every moment until she died. But his father, he says, Laertes, is still alive, though every day he wishes for death. Then Eumaeus tells Odysseus about his own childhood, that it was Odysseus's mother who raised him alongside her own daughter, that she treated him like one of her own, and when he was old enough, sent him to live where he is now, to be the swineherd to the palace. They really sugarcoat slavery here? This guy is supposed to be pretty thrilled with his lot in life, even when he talks about being owned. It's weird. But then this was definitely written by the people who owned the slaves, and I'm sure they thought they were doing these people a real favor by, you know, owning them. But as I say too often, I digress. That night, they sleep, Odysseus staying with Eumaeus in his little house near the pigs, while Telemachus gets even closer to Ithaca. Telemachus and his men arrive on the shores just off of Ithaca. They arrive on the shores, and just as Athena instructed him, Telemachus tells the men to handle the ship. He's going to go visit the swine herd before returning home to Ithaca. But the stranger murderer they picked up before leaving Pelos, whose name is Theoclymenus, where is he to go? He asks Telemachus. Cannot go to my home. Not now, Telemachus tells Theoclymenus. I won't be there, and Penelope, my mother, will be hiding from the suitors. No, he says, you should instead go to another house. Go to the house of Eurymachus, the leading suitor, the one most likely to marry my mother and take all the riches, but that should still go to Odysseus. Only Zeus knows, he tells Theoclymenus, but he may die a horrible death before that wedding occurs. A very weird way of suggesting a place to stay, but then Telemachus can be a weird kid. He's the son of Odysseus, after all. Just as he tells this to Theoclymenus, a hawk flies overhead with a pigeon in its talons. Lots of bird omens in Greek mythology, specifically Homer. This hawk, though, is a symbol of Apollo. Theoclymenus takes this omen and tells Telemachus that it's a sign. A sign that Telemachus' family still holds all the power in Ithaca, that they will remain kings forever. Telemachus is so thankful for this omen from Theoclymenus that, in the end, 
He suggests that he not go to Eurymachus's home, but to the home of his most loyal man, who's been with him since he first set off in P- to Pelos. And with that, Telemachus continues on to visit Eumaeus, the swineherd, while the rest of the men set sail again toward Ithaca itself. At dawn, Eumaeus and Odysseus make breakfast inside the small home on Eumaeus's farm. Before long, they hear footsteps. Odysseus is worried at first. There's footsteps, but Eumaeus's dogs aren't barking as they do with strangers. Before he can worry too long or do anything about it, there he is. Telemachus, his own son, all grown up, is standing at the gate. Before Odysseus can speak a word, Eumaeus runs toward Telemachus, hugging him tightly. He's so happy to have the boy back, so grateful he's safe. Telemachus, too, is happy to see Eumaeus and refers to him as Grandpa, which is a nice indicator that Eumaeus' love for Odysseus' family isn't totally one-sided. Telemachus tells Eumaeus he's happy to see him, that he wanted to visit him when he first arrived back, and to ask if his mother, Penelope, is still hiding in the house, or if she's finally agreed to marry one of the suitors. Eumaeus reassures Telemachus that all is as it was, that Penelope is still hiding away, avoiding the suitors as best she can. Of course, this reassures Odysseus, too, that Penelope is still waiting patiently for him to return home. Odysseus offers his son a seat, but Telemachus defers to the stranger, who appears to him as an old, ragged man, letting him keep the chair. Telemachus asks Eumaeus about the stranger, this man sitting at his table, Eumaeus tells him he wishes to travel back to Ithaca with Telemachus, but Telemachus doesn't want him anywhere near the suitors. They're far too dangerous, he says. Too dangerous for this ragged old man. Throwing a real wrench in Odysseus's plan, he's forced to speak up. He comes to Telemachus's defense, angrily denouncing the suitors and what they've done to the family and the palace. Telemachus explains a bit about what's been happening, why he hasn't been able to stop the suitors before he sends Eumaeus off to the palace to speak with Penelope and tell her that he's back safe from Pelos. He tells Eumaeus that he mustn't tell anyone else where he is, only his mother, that Telemachus will wait here until he returns. He warns him, The suitors are plotting my death, so it must remain a secret. Eumaeus leaves, but before he does, he asks Telemachus if he should also tell Laertes that he's returned home safely. But no, it's decided that Penelope can send a servant in secret to Laertes. No, Eumaeus must return as soon as he's told Penelope. As Eumaeus leaves the house, a woman appears outside. It's Athena. Odysseus can see, though he's the only one. She motions to him to come outside, to speak with her, and he does. She tells him, now's the time. He must come up with a plan to kill the suitors. And then she transforms him. She makes him younger, she gives him good clothes, she makes him tan and healthy, she grows his beard long and dark. She makes him Odysseus. Odysseus, now Odysseus again, returns inside the house and sits back down in front of his son, Telemachus. Oh, friends, another episode of the Odyssey come and gone. And okay, so this one was slow. I'm sorry. We're building up to so much. And know that even though this one was slow, I cut out so many extraneous details because this is Homer and the man loves his pointless side stories. Boy, does he. Anyway, oh, Odysseus. Things are really turning around for my main man. Next week, shit's really going down. A big thank you again for all the books you all have donated. It's incredible, and I love you, and honestly, I'm totally blown away. I also want to cryptically say that one of you has helped me with another project I intend to work on that I like to think many of you will also be excited about. As I've mentioned, I'm in the process of moving right now, so everything is in boxes and unable to be shared, but as I unpack my new apartment and set up what I'm calling my podcast corner, I'm going to share it with all of you on my Instagram because I love setting shit up and can't wait to make a beautiful mythology-obsessed apartment and podcast space. I'll also be sharing some of the books you all have donated because I'm so excited to read them and to have additional sources for more episodes of the podcast. 
It's been so helpful already, and it's giving me countless new ideas on stories I have to tell. Greek and Roman mythology is endless, and I will be with you all for so long because of all these wonderful donations. Thank you again. You're all the best. I'm Liv, and I truly love this shit. <laughs>